Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Ethereum 2.0 randomness using a verifiable delay function. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, how to build a randomness beacon using a new primitive called a VDF. And then I'm going to explain how to build the VDF, the cryptography that goes behind it, and the hardware, the supporting hardware. There should be some time for questions at the end. Uh, the mics are here. OK. Um, so let's get started with the randomness beacon. So we use uh, the randomness in uh, two different places. We use it uh, at the consensus layer in the beacon chain. And basically, we're doing secure sampling of validators. We have this huge pool of validators, each with 32 ETH. Uh, that could be 100,000 or even millions of validators. And we're basically um, sampling uh, what we call leaders and committees. And uh, that's part of the, the, the process of Ethereum 2.0. In addition to using it at the consensus layer, we can also expose it in the shards at the application layer. So through an opcode uh, in Ethereum 2.0, you should be able to have totally unbiasable randomness as a core primitive in the virtual machine. And so that should be useful for lotteries and gambling and gaming and all sorts of other applications. So what are the goals for the randomness beacon? Uh, we want it to be unpredictable, of course. We want it to be unbiasable, and it turns out that's uh, much more difficult to do. And uh, we also want it to be unstoppable, and I'll talk more about that later. So um, there's basically two classical families of randomness beacons. There's beacons based on commit reveal, uh, for example, uh, Randall. And these uh, randomness beacons have an attack, which is called the last revealer attack. So you have an ordered uh, list of participants, and then when you're about to use the randomness, the last participant can either reveal or not reveal, and therefore bias the randomness. And then you have approaches such as the, the definity construction, um, which is based on threshold cryptography. And these uh, basically uh, require a certain threshold of online participants to create the next random number. And so if you don't have enough online participants, the randomness beacon stalls, and in the case of Definity, that just um, stops the whole blockchain. So um, just to give a bit more context on this last condition, um, one of the design goals of Ethereum 2.0 is to survive World War III. So we're assuming that 80% of the nodes could go offline, and we still want the system to run. Um, so let me briefly um, explain how Randau works, because we're going to be building upon it. So in Randau, you have a Randau epoch, uh, about 17 minutes, and that's 128 slots. Each slot is um, eight seconds, uh, basically in the beacon chain. And in each slot, you have a beacon proposer. The beacon proposer is invited to create a block and basically reveal a secret that they've committed to uh, in the past. So uh, the first beacon proposer reveals a sec his secret, which is like local entropy, and it, it, it contributes to this pool of entropy through the Randall mix. So we have the, the next uh, revealer that's mixed in using uh, the XOR sign. Um, you know, it's OK if uh, some uh, proposers uh, don't show up and don't reveal. We just move on. And then once we want to use the randomness, for example, at the very end of the epoch, at slot 128, um, this is where the problems start coming up, because the, the last revealer already knows all the previous actions of the, 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 the previous proposers, and so they have a choice. They can either uh, stay put and not reveal, or reveal their secret. And effectively, they can choose uh, between two random numbers, and they'll choose whichever is most favorable to them, and that opens the door to various attacks. Okay, so... Um, we have this new cryptographic primitive, which is uh, very recent, uh, just a few months old, and um, it, it's a VDF. So the function part of it is very simple, it just means that you have an input, and for every input, you have a unique output. And if you want, you can think of it as a, as a hash function. Uh, there's a second parameter, which is the difficulty. So the difficulty specifies the amount of sequential work that needs to be done in order to compute the output. 
So we're talking about inherently sequential computation, which takes time. And this is where the, the delay uh, part of VDF comes in. And then we have a second output, which is the proof. And uh, this is where the verifiable part comes in. Basically, once you've done the computation um, and you have the output, you can also produce a proof and give the proof to others and convince them that the output corresponds to the input immediately without having to do all this sequential work. OK, so this is the, um, the gist of the construction. We have two parts. We have the Randall mixing uh, period, which is one epoch, and that produces a biasable Randall mix. And then you feed in the Randall mix uh, into your VDF. The VDF is going to take time to compute, at least one epoch of guaranteed delay. And then on the other side, the output is going to be your unbiasable randomness. OK? So this is uh, briefly the, the safety argument. Why does this produce unbiasable randomness? So uh, if you look at one given epoch, uh, you will have at least one honest proposer. And the reason is because we have 128 blocks, and we have an honesty assumption and a liveness assumption, which says that it, with very high probability, we'll have the, at least one. And if you look at the last honest proposer, um, that will be the point after which everything is predictable by the attacker. So the attacker can try and build various Randall mixes, given his local entropy, and he can start feeding it into the VDF as soon as possible. But the VDF is going to give you a guaranteed delay of one epoch, which means that all the outputs you know, will be produced after the end of the Randall epoch, and it will be too late to try and bias the randomness because every action that has been made is now binding. The, the blockchain has, has uh, moved forward. OK, so in order to get this uh, guaranteed delay, we are making a, a safety assumption which is rooted in hardware. And specifically, we want to prevent uh, an attacker, even an attacker with a huge budget, to be able to build specialized hardware which is significantly faster than what uh, can be done on the commodity hardware. So the speed at which you compute the VDF, the function, is going to depend on the hardware you have. And basically, we want the good guys um, to be not too bad relative to the bad guys. And in particular, um, we have this AMAX protocol parameter, the maximum speed advantage that an attacker can have. Um, and for example, we can set it to 10. And the, the, the strategy that the Ethereum Foundation is taking is um, actually to go ahead and build the best ASIC that we can uh, and give it away to the world uh, so that the, the, the baseline for the commodity hardware is actually pretty good so that we can uh, simultaneously have a very conservative AMAX, uh, but at the same time have a, a reasonably small AMAX. OK, uh, we also have a, a liveness assumption. So we need at least one person in the whole world to be running the commodity uh, hardware. Um, and the strategy of the Ethereum Foundation here is basically to build thousands of rigs and give them away to the community for free. Uh, give them a way to the Ethereum community, but also uh, beyond that, for example, to, to, to third parties. Um, and if at least one of these pieces of hardware uh, stays online, then we're good. OK, so we have the commodity hardware, and we have this AMAX assumption. Now it's very easy to have a guaranteed delay of one epoch. All you need to do is um, target a, a evaluation period of AMAX epochs, and an attacker will only be able to shrink that down to nothing less than one epoch. And this is the, 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 the whole scheme, uh, basically. So we have part one, uh, the Randall mixing process produces biasable entropy. This um, is taken by the VDF evaluators. We need at least one in the world to, to do that. They will start the number crunching, that was going to take a, a bunch of time, about three hours. And then after three hours, pops out uh, the unbiasable randomness. And then we need a, a, a one epoch inclusion buffer for the randomness to come back on chain. And again, you know, within one epoch, we're assuming that there's at least one honest participant, and that participant will make sure that it's uh, on, on chain. 
And what we do is we basically have a recursive construction. So we use the strong randomness, the unbiasable randomness, to reseed the next 128 uh, proposers. And also another thing that we want is we want uh, a new random number at every epoch. You know, we want a reasonable, reasonably fast generation of these things, and so we're going to have parallel randomness beacons, and they're going to be staggered uh, in this fashion. Okay, so that's it for the randomness beacon. Now let's have a look how do we actually go about instantiating a VDF. So. Um, the VDFs, they tend to be built as a, a basic building block, a round, and you keep on iterating this round many, many, many times. And so the basic building block that we have is the squaring function. So you take a number, you multiply it by itself, that's it. And then you reduce uh, modulo n, where n is an unfactorizable RSA modulus. So no one knows the factorization of n. And basically, you, you do multiple squarings, um, you do t squarings, where t is going to be your time parameter, and the, the output is going to be uh, x to the 2 to the t. Okay, so let's go through the whole VDF scheme in one slide. Super simple. Um, so the output, as I said, is going to be x to the 2 to the t mod n. And then uh, we want uh, to build the proof. So the proof is going to be based on a, a challenge response scheme where uh, a random challenge will be uh, uh, given to, um, <clears throat> to the person wanting to build the proof, and then they will build this proof with, uh, as shown. Uh, and you can make it non-interactive with the Fiat Shamir scheme. And then the verification is just checking this equality. So this equality is very fast to check. It takes about one millisecond. Uh, on a single core, and it's basically two small exponentiations and a multiplication. So this is the scheme by Benjamin Wasilowski uh, from June 2018, extremely nice. But there is uh, one uh, important detail, which is how do you generate the, um, the modulus? We need to have an RSA modulus which no one can factor. And so uh, there's various ways to get such a modulus, but uh, the, the preferred approach that we're uh, looking into is having a, an RSA ceremony. So this is similar to what Zcash did with the powers of tau. So you have a bunch of participants, for example, 1,000 participants, and they're going to um, participate in what's called a multi-party computation. And you need just one of them to be honest in order for the output, which is um, a 2,000-bit RSA modulus, to be unfactorizable uh, by, by everyone. And you know, just to speed things up, we could have a trustless coordinator in the middle, uh, as shown. So uh, the team that is working on the multi-party computation is Ligero. Um, they're experts in MPCs, uh, and they're from a couple of universities. And this is, th these are like the, um, the parameters of the, the ideal um, uh, multi-party computation that they're, they're building. So, we're looking to have 1,000 participants, which is much bigger than the, the Zcash. That they only had 88 participants, I believe. We're looking to produce a modulus of size uh, 2,000 bits. It's n minus 1 maliciously secure, which means that you only need one honest participant to be there. Uh, one of the things which might be a bit tricky is um, it's a synchronous thing. So everyone needs to be online at the same time to participate. The good news is that it's only a one-time thing, a one-time setup, and uh, it shouldn't last too long. It should last about 10 minutes. Uh, and part of the reason why it's so short is because uh, they got it down to just 20 rounds of communication. OK, so now the, um, the last piece of the puzzle, uh, the VDF hardware. Um, so right now, we're working with um, universities around the world that specialize in hardware implementation of modular multiplication. And uh, they have various uh, candidate circuits, um, and some of them are extremely fast. And based on the circuits that they've presented, this is what we believe we can achieve. Um, so we can achieve a latency of two nanoseconds per 2,000-bit uh, modular squaring. This is extremely, extremely fast. 
much faster than what a CPU or an FPGA could do. Uh, we're targeting a fairly advanced process node, uh, 16 nanometer from a, a TSMC. And the, um, the size of the chip, the die area, and the power are very reasonable. You know, 20 square millimeters, 7 watts is, is pretty good. And so we'll be taking these, these ASICs and putting them in a rig. Um, the, each rig would have um, A max the number of ASICs, so maybe about 10 ASICs, and that will um, lead to each machine uh, consuming about 100 watts. Uh, and the machine hopefully should look something like a Mac Mini that you just plug in the wall and it, it just works. Um, building hardware is expensive. Uh, you know, we're talking uh, tens of millions of dollars, especially that we, uh, we want to give away the rigs uh, completely for free. Uh, but I'm very proud to announce that we're making a partnership uh, with Filecoin. So uh, we've agreed on a 50-50 split on the uh, current ongoing research. And if we are going to go through with the whole project, then I think that would be the, the largest cross-blockchain collaboration uh, ever. Um, we also, you know, inviting more uh, other blockchain projects to come in. So uh, Chia is working on VDFs. Um, I know that Tessos is looking to upgrade their randomness. They're more than welcome to come in. Um, Cardano could use VDFs. Algorand could use VDFs. Um, the more, the merrier. Um, we'll have a, a better ASIC at the end, uh, and every participant will have to, to, to pay less for, for the ASIC. So it's, it's a win-win. We really encourage uh, collaboration here. Uh, one of the exciting things that we're looking to do to get the fastest possible circuit that we can is to organize an open source hardware competition. So anyone who knows how to design a hardware circuit will be invited to uh, design uh, latency optimized multi uh, modular multiplication circuits. Uh, and there will be very large cash prizes uh, for, for the participants. Um, we're also doing uh, research between now and the competition. So the competition maybe will happen mid-2019. And so right now we're looking at all the possible ways in which we could squeeze latency to get a really good uh, commodity ASIC. So if you have expertise in any of these things on the right, uh, modular multiplication, reduction trees, compressors, uh, finfets, uh, please email us. and. Today, we just uh, released this website, vdfresearch.org, where you will find uh, tens of links, maybe 30, 40 links, and you'll be able to, to dig in more into, um, into the content. So just to give a little bit of perspective on, um, on what we're building here, what we're looking to build, let's compare the VDFs uh, with a traditional proof of work. So, VDFs offer something uh, rather unique, which is uh, unbiasable leader election. But they're also um, much less costly than, than proof of work. So uh, in terms of the energy expenditure, um, it's about 10,000 times less energy than proof of work. And in terms of hardware, uh, proof of work right now uh, requires about 10 million GPUs for Ethereum, whereas we need only a few thousand for the VDF. And also, uh, in terms of protocol subsidies, it's very expensive. You know, all the hodlers uh, need to pay a billion dollars of inflation per year to support the proof of work, whereas for VDF, the um, incentive would be uh, fairly small, about a thousand times less. Okay, so this is my uh, conclusion slide, and, and then we can take questions. So if we are going to go through with this project, and I really hope we do, uh, then we'll be basically breaking uh, several world records. So we'll have the first World War III proof on biasable randomness, the only construction that we know that has both the unbiasable aspect and the strong liveness uses VDFs. We will be organizing the largest multi-party competition ever, the previous re uh, record uh, was, was Zcash. 
we would be uh, building the, uh, the first open source ASIC. You know, open source ASICs haven't really been done before, uh, so this is very exciting for me. And also, as I mentioned, uh, we are looking to have the, the largest cross-blockchain collaboration to actually build this thing uh, as an industry-wide project. Okay, thank you. So we have about 10 minutes of questions. There's the microphones on both sides. Thank you for, for the talk. Uh, so a question about the uh, RSA uh, number generation ceremony. Uh, can you talk a bit more about this and how is, um, um, like, it, what is the input from each participant and how is the resulting number going to be uh, bound to, to uh, 2048 bits? Okay, so you, uh, you want to know about the details of the, the MPC. So this is, this is still kind of a, a bit of open research and somewhat beyond my field of expertise, but basically uh, every participant has um, a, a random number, and then you take the random numbers from every participant and you add them in such a way that no one knows uh, what, the, uh, what the addition is, and then you do uh, bi-primality testing on the results. So basically, in, in, a, in a way that no one knows the, the details of the secrets, you, you, you check that you're basically looking for a number that is the product of two primes. And if it's not the product of two primes, you do that again and again and again. So you do many, many rounds until you find a number that is uh, suitable. Yeah. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, am I right in saying that the problem with Definity that you defined was that it fails if nodes go offline? Right, so Definity has a uh, two-thirds uh, honest and online assumption. So um, I made the calculations, if, if roughly 10 to 15% of the honest nodes go offline in some sort of uh, catastrophic situation, or even not so catastrophic situation, uh, then the beacon would stall and the whole blockchain would stall. Okay, so I just want to challenge part of that assumption. I'm not linked to Definity or anything like that. Um, you're asking us to trust three aspects here. One, that the signing ceremony won't generate toxic waste. Two, that this centralized hardware will be trustable. And three, that this brand new set of cryptography from this year is the right thing to use, rather than just trust that 10% of people won't go offline simultaneously. Right, I mean, uh, you can pick the whatever trade-off you want. It's true that uh, a pure software... We don't get to pick it, you're picking it. No, no th at the end of the day, this is a, a community the decision, and uh, we're just uh, making a suggestion here. Um, there is a trade-off, you know, you can either have strong liveness um, and hardware, or you can have a pure software solution and, 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 and no, uh, no strong liveness. I mean, as a lot of the infrastructure that we're building for, for Ethereum 2.0, actually all the infrastructure, is designed around strong liveness. Uh, so that is not something that we want to compromise on. Uh, what is totally possible is actually to just stick with Randall. Randall is a, um, is a pure uh, uh, software solution with no hardware. But there's actually no loss in uh, having hardware that will upgrade Randall. And the reason is that um, there's two ways that the hardware can fail, or the cryptography can fail. Number one, um, the, um, the RSA uh, modulus is factored, for example, by, uh, by a quantum computer. And in which case, it would, be, um, it would take no time for an attacker to compute the VDF. In that case, we fall back on the safety of Randall. In the case where all the hardware suddenly goes offline, or, or is all hacked at the same time, then we, instead of having a liveless failure, we also fall back on Randall for liveness. So, um, the VDF is a strict upgrade over Randall. Um, yeah. So you mentioned about uh, synchronicity for multi-party computation. Uh, can you expand why uh, you would need a synchronous uh, ceremony? I didn't hear the whole question, but I think you're asking uh, why, why do we need to have a synchronous MPC? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
simply because with uh, the state of the art of RSA uh, MPCs, we just don't know how to make them asynchronous. Um, the, the Zcash powers of Tau was asynchronous, and I believe this is a more the exception than the rule. Um, so the current state of the art is, is synchronous, so we're, we're stuck with that. The best we can do is make sure that the, uh, the duration of the MPC is as small as possible um, so that uh, we don't waste people's time. Uh, what's the fundamental reason for, uh, at a high level, can you expand on that? Yeah, again, I mean, the MPC is going beyond my, my uh, domain of expertise. Uh, there will be a public, uh, paper published soon, I, I believe, by, by the Ligero team, and actually their work is based on a paper from uh, Crypto 2018, so I can point to you if, you, if you email me, I'll point to you to the paper. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the VDF. So you are using the VDF, which is uh, easy to speed up using ASICs, right? So you, your VDF is easily speeded up. Uh, have you considered, you know, like doing a competition for a VDF which would be ASIC resistant? If you like spending $20 million on the ASIC, maybe you can take a million dollars and try to like look <coughs> for different VDFs. Right. Um, so there are different uh, VDF constructions and there's some VDF which are known as proto VDFs where instead of having an exponential gap between uh, the prover and the verifier, you only have a constant gap. And one of the teams, uh, blockchain teams, is uh, called Solana. They're actually going that way. So they're using uh, repeated uh, SHA-256, I believe, as the VDF. And in order to allow for parallel verification, they have these uh, checkpoints. And then they use GPUs uh, for the massively parallel verification. And the assumption there is that uh, you know, Intel is very good at designing uh, SHA-256 instructions. Um, I, what I can tell you is that I'm, from the little that I know about the hardware from studying for the last few months, I'm actually, I'd be actually very surprised if Intel has an optimal uh, implementation. Like, I initially, uh, I, was, I was thinking that, you know, modular multiplication would, uh, for, for us, 2,000-bit modular multiplication would take maybe uh, 10 or 20 nanoseconds. Now we got it down to 2 nanoseconds, and there's these you know, pretty uh, fancy optimizations, which I don't expect Intel to do necessarily. Um, you know, you have a trade-off between latency, power, area, and, and Intel is trying to find something reasonable. We only want to uh, optimize latency. Hey, Justin, um, just a quick question about, um, about the VDF. So, so one of the inputs is, is a difficulty setting. So, so can you talk just a little bit about how that's calculated and, um, and maybe possibly what the implications are? Is there an attack vector there, possibly? Could it be manipulated? Right. Um, so the, the, the AMAX assumption that I've been talking about, um, we believe we can have it hold for at least five years. So for at least five years, we won't need any more uh, ASICs, um, and we won't need a difficulty adjustment scheme. And um, once we have the length of the Randall Epoch, which is probably going to be something like 17 minutes, and we know Amax, so for example, Amax equals 10, then we just set difficulty to take 170 minutes uh, on the commodity hardware. So that, 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 that's all it is. Um, in a, if we want to move to a more long-term solution, where we want to have a dynamic uh, difficulty adjustment where, for example, new hardware enters the market and we want the difficulty to, uh, to go up um, organically, we would need to have a difficulty adjustment uh, mechanism there. It does introduce some uh, complexity, so um, there is some trade-offs there. I mean, I, I wrote an EVE research post um, on, the, on mitigating the main attack, um, so I'm, I would be welcome. I'm happy to, to link it to you. And just one other question, say, say the VDF somehow goes offline, all of them, does, does that, um, do, you, do you have a, uh, does that change the assumptions? Do you have a way to uh, account mm -hmm. for the fact that now the, the randomness is, is coming from Randau? Um, yeah, so, um, 
So in, in this slide, we're basically recursively using the randomness uh, to select the next randall. And if the randomness doesn't come on, on chain soon enough, which should not happen, but let's say there's some sort of exceptional condition, then we just use the, the blue die as opposed to, to the red die. So we fall back on, uh, on Randall. Uh, at the application layer, things are actually better. So uh, the, in the opcode, you will specify the, the epoch, and it will return you know, either no randomness, like 0, 0, 0, or it will give you the randomness. And so you can design your application in such a way that it will just retry until it eventually gets the randomness. OK, thank you. Hello. Um, is there any sort of incentive for the ones that you are entrusting with the VDF ASICs to maintain that they ensure, to ensure that they are honest other than goodwill and that they're probably highly involved in the scene as well? Uh, right. So I guess we'll make sure to um, widely distribute the ASICs. And one way to do that is to just give it away for free. Um, there will be in-protocol incentives. So the easiest incentive to, um, to implement is to provide a reward for the block proposer who includes uh, the, uh, the, the randomness and the proof. Um, we could also uh, directly incentivize the evaluator by giving them a reward. Uh, and we do have schemes for that, but there's a trade-off between uh, basically introduces complexity and more uh, burden on the beacon chain. So I think it's reasonable, you know, if we have thousands of nodes of VDF rigs distributed around the world, you know, the foundation will run rigs, um, exchanges will run rigs, investors will run rigs, enthusiasts will run rigs, and we just need one of them to be online. I think that's, that's not too bad. And the, the uh, incentivization for the block proposers, that in actually incentivizes uh, sophisticated uh, block proposers to run a VDF rig themselves and maybe to overclock it just a little bit so that they'll be slightly before everyone else and they'll get the reward. Uh, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, so you, you suggested that the, the VDF rigs would uh, upload or would have their uh, output inside of the block that they propose, correct? Uh, that the, the proposers would have their VDF output inside of what they propose and get rewarded for that because they, they submit that. Would that imply that these VDF ASICs or rigs are running concurrently with the validators? Um, so anyone can be a, a, a VDF evaluator. You don't have to be collateralized. You don't have to be a validator. But in the special case where you are a validator and you want to earn a little bit more money and you are sophisticated, you can run the hardware in parallel and you can try and, and, and make it run slightly faster. Uh, you know, maybe cool it a bit better. Um, you know, one of the things that would be cool on, on, on this question is uh, if we could have one of the rigs in the satellite around the world. Uh, you know, at least we have this one node that's, that's online. Thank you. Oh, I'm out of time. I'm so sorry. I'm more than happy to speak about this all day long. So please come, uh, come to me uh, after the talk. Thank you.